Yeah. I think I'm on. Yeah, I'm on. Today's message, the rich man and Lazarus, is really about priorities. It's about whether do you want the good or do you want the great? Do you know what's good or you don't you want what's best? If you, you want what's important this in this life for this short period of time? Or do you want what's good for all eternity? That's the issue today. It's not about rich and pure poor. We're not gonna talk about the prosperity gospel or any of that nonsense. What we're gonna talk about today is the priorities in our lives. And here's a, a man who probably in his life, thought his priorities were okay. The rich man in that day was considered godly and favored by God because he had money. If his health was good, if he had plenty of clothes to wear, a good, good home to live in, lots of good sumptuous food, he was considered a man favored by God. If he was sick, he, he was maimed, he was halt, he was blind, he was deaf, then he was considered a person not favored by God. But we see, as we get into this a little later, we'll see that that's absolutely not the case. You see, it's not about what we have, who we are in this life. It's about whose we are for all eternity. And it's not about rich people not getting to heaven and all the poor people going to heaven. It's not about that because there are going to be rich people in heaven residing right beside poor people in heaven. There are going to be people of different races, different colors. The Bible says they're all, we're going to have all different kinds of people. There's going to be people in heaven you don't like. You better get used to liking everybody and loving everybody because there's going to be people in heaven that don't meet, meet your criteria. There's going to be people in hell that you'll never see because if you are in hell, you don't have the conversations with other lost people. It's a place of torment forever. And no matter how great your life is in this life, it's not even going to come close to comparing to how bad it will be in that life. If you would turn to Luke chapter 16. In, in Luke chapter 16, we're going to read verses 19 through 31. I think it says 21 in your notes. Those computers do that, those computers do that stuff all the time. Once you have found Luke chapter 16, if you would please stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. We'll begin to read with verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at the gate. It doesn't say that Lazarus came and lay at the gate. It says he was laid at the gate. He probably wasn't able to put himself there. Notice it says, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. He desired to eat crumbs. doesn't say he got any. It says he desired. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he says, I beg, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers. 
that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Father, as we consider this powerful passage, the realization that what we do here, what we have here, what we experience here, is virtually worthless compared to what we'll have in that next life. So, Father, I pray you'd speak to our hearts today that we would be attuned to what you're saying to each of us and our individual needs. And, Father, we'll give you the glory if anything good happens, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> now, first of all, there's several characters we need to look at here. First, the, the rich man is the first one. And then Lazarus the beggar is another person. And then Abraham is also in this passage. He's in verse 25. Abraham is brought up here because there is a, a, a sense with the Jewish nation that Abraham, because he is the father of the Jewish nation, that he is important. And what he says and thinks and does is important. And then there's the prophets and Moses. Moses is brought up here. The prophets are brought up here. Moses is brought up here because Moses brought his people out of bondage into freedom. And then the rich man's father and his brothers. I suspect that if every person in hell could come here today and, and stand before us, they would say, repent Surrender your life to Christ because this place that I'm in is a place of torment. It's, it's terrible. The descriptive description of this place that this rich man was existing. He wasn't living. He was existing. Living is a relationship with God. Existing is being separated from God for all eternity. In this place of torment, every lost person, every person in the pit of hell would love to come up and talk to his relatives, talk to his friends and say, don't come here if they have any decency whatsoever. But the Bible says that even though someone would come back from the dead, it wouldn't affect many people. People would ignore it. People would not listen to it. But I want you to notice the main character here is down in verse 30. And he, and he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Who is it that came from the dead to tell us about eternal life? Jesus and Jesus alone. He's the character. He's the main character in this passage. Because you see, it's not because the rich man was rich that he went to hell. It's not because Lazarus suffered so much and was sick and had sores and, and was not able to move hardly that he went to heaven. It was because he'd surrendered his life to God. I don't know when. I don't know where. I don't know how it happened. I don't know if he was well one day and sick the next. I have no clue. But I do know that the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And so somehow or another, he went through Jesus and the only way he knew how he surrendered his life to him, and he spent eternity in a place called heaven. Now, I don't know what happened with the rich man. <clears throat> I suspect, don't know this, not, nothing to hear about that, but I suspect that this rich family went to the temple on a regular basis. You see, people would have loved to have them at the temple because they gave great sums of money, most likely. Many rich people came in the temple, and they made a great showing they didn't come and, and take the offering up in a little plate and an envelope where nobody could see. They walked over and, and take big coins, big gold coins and silver coins, and they would stand, and they would drop them in and, and bang them. It would make a noise. And the more they dropped, the more noise it made and, and got people's attention. Oh, look at that man. What a great man. He's giving so much to the temple. I don't know if they did that or not, but it would make sense. Because you see, in that culture, 
if God gave you a lot of material possessions, that meant God was pleased with you. And you were at the top of the chain. And, and, and you got to heaven, you'd probably be in charge of half of heaven <clears throat> because you were rich and God favored you. But if you were poor, it must have been because of your sinner. It must have been because of something you did or your parents did. It must have been some sin that separated you from God. <clears throat> and so those who are like Lazarus, in the world's view, were the lowest of the low. They ought to get a job. And can I just tell you, I drove by a guy today, there all the time. I know he makes about $100 every Sunday getting money at the intersection. And my flesh want to roll down my window and say, hey, employment's about 3.5%. Go get a job. That's my flesh. I don't know his circumstances. I don't know what's going on with him. But I know this. God has blessed me. And I need to be a blessing when I can. We're also told to be good stewards, so we need to be careful. But at the same time, we don't need to look down on people, no matter what their circumstances are. A group of us are going to Uganda. We will pass by folks that is because of the atmosphere, we'll have, probably have our windows down on the car. You know, most of us like to sit next to the window, amen, rather than in the middle. But there you probably want to sit in the middle because when they stick that chicken leg in there that they've cooked and say, will you give me 50 cents for it, we're not likely to, to take it. And we look down sometimes on those folks. But the reality is God has blessed us so we can be a blessing. So the characters are important in this story. The rich man is important because it reminds us that he took what was good, not paying attention to what was the greatest. The greatest thing he could have done was to give away his goods and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't do that. And Lazarus, the one thing I noticed in this story, and, and I don't know this to be a fact, it's not in here, but I see nowhere that it says Lazarus complained. Lazarus didn't complain. He said, I would like to have, he said that Lazarus would desired to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. That was his desire. Didn't say he got it. That was his desire. Now we go to a restaurant sometimes and we order food and it comes out and it's not quite as hot as we want it to do. Or it doesn't look like we want it to look. And we say, I'm not eating that. Go back and get me something right. Go back and fix it like it should be fixed. We get a steak. We cut into it. <clears throat> That's too well done. I ordered it medium. I don't want that well done. Go back and fix me another steak. Or it comes out and a little bit of what we think is blood comes out of it. And we say, oh, go back and cook that some more. You see, we dis have discerning taste. No, we're spoiled. That's what we are. We're spoiled beyond measure. And this rich man was spoiled. He thought he was great with God because God had given him <clears throat> all of his wealth. And the conditions between his life on this earth and Lazarus were polar opposites. <clears throat> I'm, re I'm reminded of the, the name of Lazarus. That name in the Hebrew language means, listen carefully, that name means one who God helps. Now, that's not the first thought I think of when I think about Lazarus. <clears throat> and I guarantee you, when you read that passage and it said he had sores, the dogs licked his sores, they had to put him there, we're not thinking one who God helps. You know, the world would say, if that's the way God helps people, Spare me from God. <clears throat> but that's not the end of the story. That's not the end of eternity. You see, what happens today sometimes has no relationship to what happens in eternity. And sometimes what happens today does have a relationship with what happens in eternity, but sometimes it doesn't. You see, Lazarus was at rest 
when he died. He was in the arms of Abraham. The Bible says he was in Abraham's bosom. He was comforted. And that comfort was comfort that no earthly man could do. But he was comforted because of where he was. I wonder if these two, God could say to them, now, Mr. Rich Man, <clears throat> Mr. Lazarus, here's what we're going to do. Would you be willing to go back to earth for 10 more years and we reverse your situations? You think about that. Who do you think might say, well, yeah, let's do that? I don't think it would be Lazarus. I don't believe Lazarus would be dumb enough to give up what he got for all eternity for another 10 years of wonderful living here on this earth. <clears throat> but very often, that's what we do. We take what God gives here and we put it up on a pedestal like that's the ultimate, that's the most important aspect of it, of life. But life is simply a relationship with God. And Lazarus wouldn't give that up. He said, no, I, I, I got plenty right here. I'll stay right here. But I believe the rich man would say, I'll do it. For what I see you have and what torment I'm, ha I'm having, I'll take 10 years of living like Lazarus on this earth to get what Lazarus has right now. <clears throat> Notice the difference in their conditions. Conditions in this life the conditions in the afterlife. Now, in Matthew 8, verses 9 through 13, <clears throat> have a story about a centurion. He came to Jesus and said, My daughter needs to be healed, <clears throat> or my servant. I forget which one it is. But Jesus looked at him and said, Go your way. You've healed. And matter of fact, the, the centurion said, Listen, you don't have to come. I'm a man under authority. Somebody tells me what to do and I do it. I tell my people what to do and they do it. He understood authority. He understood the authority of God. And when he came to Jesus, Jesus said, you understand it better than the Jews. You understand it better than the people I came primarily to save. And that's an issue that we sometimes forget. I want to remind you about how important it is how important the contents or the conditions of the afterlife are. Look with me at Mark chapter 9. If you want to turn there, you can. I want to read a passage beginning in verse 42. Because this is Jesus speaking, and he warns of what the writer of this uh, version of the Bible says, warns of offenses. Verse 42, the Bible says, But whatever causes but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into, the, into, the, into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell, into the fire that will never be quenched. Where? Now listen to this. The worm does not die. And the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter the lame, life lame, rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that will never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where... The, warm, the worm never dies, and the fire is not quenched. What's it worth? What's heaven worth? Is it worth an arm? Absolutely. Is it worth a leg? Absolutely. Is it worth an eye? Absolutely. If it's, it's worth anything compared to what we can have today or in eternity separated from God. Heaven is real. Heaven is important. It's worth all that we give, and we should give all. We should give everything we are to have the prospect of an eternal life with God. 
Now I want you to notice the circumstances that separate them as well. Verse 26 reminds us of that. He says, and besides all this, between us and you there's a great gulf fix so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those there pass to us. There's no such thing as purgatory, folks. I don't care who says it. The Bible says that once you physically die in this life, your eternity is set. And there's no passing from one to the other. You don't hang out in the, in the nether, nether regions for a while, and then if you're, somebody does enough good to help you get there, you go on to heaven. Or if they don't do it, you go to hell. The reality is you are where you are when you die physically. There's no coming from there to here to here to there. And all this tormented man, this rich man, the only thing he asked was a tip, a drop of water on the tip of the finger of Lazarus. Folks, he would not have gotten within 10 feet of Lazarus when he was alive. But now he says, have him tip his finger into water and quench my tongue. Just a, just a drop of water. That's all I'm asking. One drop of water. Abraham says, not happening. You can't get from here to there, there to here. No way to get that. But once we die, our fate is set. And then I want you to notice <clears throat> the conception that is not reality. Verses 27 to 31 then he said, I beg you, therefore, that you should send him to my father's house. Again, why would Lazarus ever think about leaving? But also, he says, send him, because if one came from the dead, even a, a beggar that stood out, laid out at my gate, even that beggar with sores all over him, if he came back, they'd believe him. No, they wouldn't. Because Abraham says, they've got Moses. They've got the Word. They've got the Bible. All they've got to do is read it. It tells them everything they need to know. They go to the temple on a regular basis, most of them. They they're call themselves God's chosen people. All they've got to do is look at it. It's here. And that hasn't changed, folks. God's Word is true then. God's Word is true today. God's true, word is true for all eternity. It hasn't changed. And the man says, but, but, but wait, God, if somebody would go tell them, uh, send Lazarus to tell them. They don't need to be told. They've been told. They've heard the gospel. We here in America particularly, we've heard the gospel so much. One of my fears with children and youth and college students as they go off into the world, they've heard it so much and not responded to it, and sometimes because it hasn't been lived in front of them like it should be, they've become inoculated. They know all the answers. They know everything that goes on. They can tell you all the right answers to all the right questions, but they're lost because they've never surrendered their life to Christ. They know how to tell you they have. They know they, they can parrot all the things we've seen. I'm reminded of that little story about the six-year-old class, the first graders. The teacher is trying to make a point, and she says to them, now, children, I'm going to describe something to you, and I want you to tell me what it is. She says, this is a creature that is furry. It's got a long, bushy tail, and it runs around on the ground and runs up and down trees, and it likes all kind of nuts. Teacher, was, the, the class was just kind of stunned. And finally, one little boy said, well, teacher, that sounds like a squirrel. But I know the, na the answer is Jesus. Because every answer in that Sunday school class was Jesus. You see, we so often say, I'm going to answer the question that you have, and I'm going to say it's Jesus. I'm going to say, I trusted Jesus. I said a prayer. I went through the baptismal pool. I did all the things the church said to do, but we never surrendered to Christ. And that's what happened most likely here. And that cry that he cried out, go tell, send somebody to tell my family 
Send somebody to tell my brothers. Send somebody to tell the world that this hell is a terrible place, a place of torment. That's the cry of every person who's ever gone to hell. That's the cry of all the people who went through the motions. They showed up every Sunday. They showed up for Sunday school. They did what they thought was the right thing to do. They gave to all the causes. They were generous to the poor people and to, to the beggars, and, and they gave to ministry causes. But at the same time, they never surrendered their life to Christ. They were trying to do it by their own works and their own abilities. And they have all the info they need. And yet, they didn't do anything with it. Just as today, we have all the information we need. We have all the scripture we need. And we don't do anything with it. And folks, Jesus did come back from the dead. We celebrate that at Easter. We ought to celebrate every Sunday. Well, it will be a great celebration that he came back from the dead. He was physically dead. And he came back. And he said, here I am. And many people said, so what? Many people said, no, you, you didn't die. You, you just kind of swooned. Uh, you passed out. And in that cool, comfortable bed you were laying on, a piece of rock, you revived. And somehow or another, you got out of that tomb. We don't know how. But we know that somebody, some great army probably, or somebody with great engineering ability, roll that huge stone away. And we so convinced the guards that we had the guards pretend to pass out and go to sleep. He came back from the dead and people still reject him. This morning I want to remind you of one thing that, that we need to make very clear. All rich people do not go to hell. And all poor people do not go to heaven. Don't leave here and say, well, that rich man, <clears throat> because of the life he lived here, he just gave up heaven. So all rich people die and go to hell. No. None of us deserve heaven. The rich man didn't deserve it. Lazarus didn't deserve it. I don't care how much his sores hurt. I don't care how hungry he was all the time. No matter how much he endured, he still did not, does not deserve a place in heaven on his own. None of us do. It is by God's grace. It is by God's mercy. It is by God's sacrifice on the cross and his grace alone that anyone goes to heaven. The only people that go to heaven <clears throat> are those surrendered to Christ, not not because of what they did here, not because of how good they were here, not because of, of how, much, how many good deeds they did. They go to heaven because they surrendered their life to Christ. It's not about what we do. It's about what Christ does in and through us. That We have an opportunity to spend eternity with God, not separated from God, but with God for all eternity. It's just not about us in the least. It's about him. He sacrificed. He died for our sins. He paid the penalty that we owe so that we could spend eternity with him and have fellowship with him and live. Otherwise, when we reject that, we die. God does it all. He does everything about it. And, and actually, in our salvation, is all him because he calls us and His Holy Spirit convicts us and draws us to Him. All we do is we accept it. <clears throat> and we say, okay. Thank you, Jesus. Would you stand with me? I want to pray for us. I want you to think about <clears throat> your experience. <clears throat> Have you had an experience of surrendering to God? Was your experience about what you've done to attain heaven? Fathers, we stand before you. <clears throat> we thank you that you did something we could never do. 
who took care of our sin debt. 